Hey, happy Tuesday, everyone, and thank you for coming back and joining me tonight here on Next on the T. I'm your host, Chris Mascaro, and I hope everybody out there is doing all right. It's a beautiful start to the week, a little cooler than I think I'd like it this time of year as we, uh, you know, we're in mid-April now, and uh, I was expecting a little warmer temperatures in around, especially here in Atlanta, but uh, but no dice. We're still we're still pretty cool, and uh, I certainly feel for our good friends up in the northern part of the country, Midwest, Northeast. I know you guys are still getting hammered with the cold temperatures and snow and that sort of thing. I just hope for all of us. That, uh, that we get to have a nice spring, and we get to have spring, right? We don't go right from winter into summer, so hopefully we'll start to see a little bit of warmer temperatures. Forecast here in Atlanta says we're going to get up into the upper 60s and the 70s, so hopefully we get to enjoy those beautiful temperatures for a while before we get into the upper 80s and the 90s. You know, folks, tonight here on Next on the T, we've got a great hour in store for you. My, my first guest is, is one of the best instructors anywhere on the planet, and that's Tom Patry. Tom was a, a champion in junior golf. He led Florida Southern to a Division II national championship, won the individual honors there. He played out on the PGA Tour. He's in the Hall of Fame for his high school, his college, the conference that he played in in college, the Sun, uh, Sunshine State Conference. He's been a, a golf magazine top 100 instructor every year since 2000. So you can see why. If, if your game needs help, you want to find Tom wherever he's teaching. Throughout the year, you're going to find him in different locations. You know, in the wintertime, he's down in Naples, Florida. Pretty soon, he's going to be up on Long Island, spend some time in Maryland at Bully Rock as well. So, you know, and if, if all else fails, he'll even come to you. So you need to go on his, to- on his uh, website, TomPatry.com, to find out about that. So it's always so much fun when I get to spend some time with Tom. So he'll join me here in just a few minutes. Following him, I'm going to get a return visit from Dr. Bob Jones, the fourth grandson of Bobby Jones. It has been such a privilege getting to know Doc over the last nine months or so. Not only does he have a lot of great stories about his grandfather, he's also got a lot of great advice for improving our mental approach when we're out there on the golf course. He has his doctorate degree in uh, clinical psychology. He's working now as a sports psychologist. So I'll get his thoughts. You know, we'll go back. We'll talk a little bit about the Masters. We'll also talk about how we can help us have more confidence in our own abilities, right? Plus, how can we better deal with anxiety, whether it's on or off the golf course. So we're going to get a lot of help from him, a lot of help for junior golfers that are out there dealing with some things, being in front of galleries for the first time. So looking forward to catching up with Doc a little bit later on in this half hour. So folks, a lot of great stories coming your way tonight on this edition of Next on the Tee. Thank you so much for tuning in and taking the journey with me over the next hour. Before we get started, though, I want to remind you about our good friend Matthew Lawrence and his show Backspin Golf, which airs Sunday mornings from 8 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. It's my regular Sunday morning, 8.03 a.m. Tea Time. It's broadcast on ESPN Radio, AM 1300, WLXG up in Lexington, Kentucky. But you can stream it live anywhere, right, by going online to WLXG.com or downloading the WLXG app. It's a great way to start your Sunday mornings. His four-minute older brother, Mitchell, also has a great golf show that marries golf and travel. It's called Talking Golf Getaways, which you can find online at golfnewsnet.com or over on Audio Boom. He and his co-host, Darren Bunch, travel all over the world, and they let you know great places to play and stay and even eat while you're there as well. Again, it's called Talking Golf Getaways, and it's available on golfnewsnet.com or over on Audio Boom. And as you know, we are sponsored here on Next on the Tee by the French Lick Resort. Let's hear a word from our friend Steve Rondonero about what they have going on there. Play legendary golf at French Lick Resort, the only place in the country where you can play courses by two Hall of Fame designers on the same property. Our Pete Dye and Donald Ross courses offer two very different challenges. Experience them both and save with our Hall of Fame package. Our two historic hotels are unique as well. Cap it off with a fun visit to the French Lick Casino. Check us out online at FrenchLick.com. Bring a group and save even more. Play legendary golf this season at French Lick Resort. Yeah, folks, go online at FrenchLick.com to see for yourself what a wonderful place it is and to book your stay as well. 
And folks, you've heard me talking about Club Hub sensors over the last several months. It is the best portable shot tracking and swing analysis golf device out there on the market. Other shot trackers tell you what happened. Club Hub's going to tell you what happened and why. Take the progress that you make over on the practice tee directly to your rounds with the only device of its kind that can go on the course with you. I have Club Hub sensors on all of my clubs. They screw right into the tops of your grips, and I can tell you, since I put the Club Hub sensors on my clubs, I've learned more about my swing and all the data surrounding it than I've learned over the 40 years I've been playing the game. Because not only do you get GPS distances to the hazards and to the green, but after your round, you can look back at the images and the layout of every hole of the course that you just played and see exactly where and how far you hit every shot. Another GPS tool on the market captures that and lets you go back and review your round the way the Club Hub app does. It's available for Android or iPhones, and the app keeps track of your swing speed of every club in your bag, your tempo, your angle of attack, plus you're going to get a 3D view of your swing as well. And no other rangefinder can do all of that for you. Go over to clubhubgolf.com and order your set of Club Hub sensors today and enter the coupon code NEXT to get 10% off on all products at checkout. Again, clubhubgolf.com, enter the coupon code NEXT, and you're going to get the best GPS and swing analysis tool on the market for a great low price, and you're going to see your game in a whole new way. Please also check out our friends over at the Bobby Jones Apparel Company by going online to bobbyjones.com. Their spring collection has arrived. The shift in seasons is an opportunity to change things up layer upon layer. They've added some great new details, fresh colors, new additions with genuine enduring character. They make style easy. Find carefully coordinated outfits in a variety of colors and options by going online, again, to bobbyjones.com. We are also proud to be uh, partnering with Russ Holden and the folks over at Caddy for a Cure. One of the most unique opportunities in the world of professional golf is now available to you through Caddy for a Cure. Spend a day inside the ropes with one of the world's best players as their caddy. It's a fantastic way to have the time of your life while supporting our wounded service members and Fanconi Anemia. You're going to get to walk side-by-side side with your tour player experiencing professional golf as an insider. In addition to the amazing experience that you're going to have, you're going to get a fantastic gift package from Caddy for a Cure, including Under Armour logo apparel and an eyewear package, a tour-grade caddy bib suitable for autographs and framing, a tin cup ball marking gift, chef's cut real jerky, and professional photographs from your day. Go online to caddyforacure.com to learn more. That's C-A-D-D-Y-F-O-R-A-C-U-R-E, caddyforacure.com. All right, now back with me here on the French Lick Resort guest line is one of Golf Magazine's top 100 instructors, Tom Patry. Let me remind you about Tom's background. He grew up in Middle Island, Long Island, New York. In 1973, he won the Long Island Boys Championship and the Long Island Private Schools Championship. In all, he won 15 events during his junior golf career. Played his college golf at Florida Southern, where he was a two-time first-team All-American. In 1980, he helped Florida Southern to a runner-up finish in the Division II National Championship. Came back the next year in 81, and they won it. And Tom took the individual honors as well. Tom is in both his high school and his college Hall of Fames. In 1992, he was inducted into the Sunshine State Conference Hall of Fame. He turned pro and played professionally from 1981 to 1988, playing in the U.S., Mexico, Canada, Europe, and over in South Africa. He later became the director of golf instruction at Westchester Country Club, site of the Westchester Classic and several other PGA and LPGA Tour events. He's been named the Teacher of the Year everywhere he's been. Golf Magazine has named him, like I say, a top 100 instructor every year since 2000. And beyond all of that, Tom is also an excellent writer. You can find numerous articles published in Golf Magazine, Golf Digest, and Golf Illustrated. He's also written a wonderful book, The Six-Spoke Approach to Golf, which is a five-star rated book over on Amazon.com. You've likely seen Tom as well on Golf, Channel, Golf Channel's Academy Live. And uh, if there is an Instructor Hall of Fame, and there needs to be one, Tom Patry needs to be in that Hall of Fame as well, and I'm honored he is back with me tonight here on Next on the Tee. Hey, Tom, thanks for coming back on the show. Chris, it's always a pleasure to be with you, pal. Hope you're doing well, and uh, I'm sure those temperatures will warm up in Atlanta, so we haven't had any snow this winter in Naples, Florida, so you need to come down and visit. <laughs> no doubt. Tom, I want to start off our time tonight by uh, getting your thoughts on what we saw at Augusta National and the Masters. What did you think? Happy, surprised, disappointed? What did you think about what you saw over the uh, four days of the tournament? 
Well, you know, I, I'm a I'm a pretty big Ricky fan, and um, Chris, I, I was that's what my 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 allegiances were there in the week, and then obviously uh, Fred Couples is a dear friend of mine, a college friend, so I was always pulling for the old guy to make the cut. And considering how bad his back was, he did a heck of a job, you know, playing 72 holes on that golf course, and and he really was in a lot of physical pain. So I was pretty proud of Fred's performance there, and, and getting through and representing the old guys. Uh, you know, I think Ricky, uh, Ricky's got one coming soon. He played a heck of a final round. Making birdie on 18 showed me a lot. Uh, he hadn't played a final round in the major quite like that. Um, you know, hats off to Patrick Reed. He obviously played wonderful golf, but, uh, I, I think Shinnecock's going to be really interesting. As a side note, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be on the range as one of the range ambassadors this year at the U.S. Open at Shinnecock for the week. So it's going to be fun to be up close and, and watch the action. So I think the second major of the year at, at places as iconic as Shinnecock will really be interesting. There's a lot of a lot of talented people playing good at the same time right now. It's going to be a heck of a year in golf going forward. So I want to build off two of the things that you just talked about, Tom. First of all, you, you talked about being a big Ricky Fowler fan. Is this the year? Do you think this is the year Ricky finally gets his major? I, I do. I, th- I think he's really, you know, knocked on the door. Times he's had a number of pretty big setbacks, Chris, where he has not played well in the final round. And I think for Ricky to play as well as he played on Sunday at Augusta, I think it was a turning point. And I think that he needed to play that kind of final round to change his belief system a little bit about about major competition. I think you know he's a wonderful young man and such a great representative of golf and, and such a great ambassador of the game. You got to pull for a kid like that hard. I, I think he, I think he's. He's very close to doing that, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see it happen this year at all. And and you talk about being an ambassador up there at Shinnecock Hills for, for the U.S. Open. Again, that, that happens in, in, in mid-June. And I know you've played there. You've had some great success on that golf course. For for folks who aren't as familiar with Shinnecock, maybe they know the name, maybe they, they've you know seen some of the tournaments in the past, but it's been a little while. Talk about that golf course and the challenge that awaits the players and how much, uh, how much of a factor the win could possibly play in the event. Well, first of all, a big shout out, uh, Chris, my, my dear college friend and, and, a, and a former competitor, uh, fellow competitor, Jack Druga, who's the director of golf there at Shinnecock, has asked me to spend the week up there with him. So I'm, thank you, Jack, for that. And I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, Shinnecock is a place that I grew up around as a kid. Uh, I used to sneak on there as a kid and play golf actually in the afternoons, Chris, and, and tried, tried my best not to get caught, although it wasn't always successful, but, you know, in recent years with Jack being there, I spent some time out there. It's a, it's a wonderful venue. It's a, you know, it's as close as this country has to a Lynx golf course. Uh, you know, they've done, they've done a massive tree removal over the last couple of years. It's, it's, it's got some incredible vistas. It's a very difficult golf course in open conditions. And the wind on the east end of Long Island where I grew up is a, is always a major factor. It, it very rarely does it not blow out there. Um, I'm sure the golf course will be firm and fast. Um, it'll be, it'll be a very different venue from anything else we see all year on the PGA Tour. It'll require a different kind of shot making and, and, and a tremendous control of your trajectories. Um, dialing your distances in will be very, very difficult. Uh, the putting surfaces are undulated. They're fast. Um, there's a, a number of greens on the golf course that are very, very slopey. Um, it, it'll test every aspect of your golf game. So it, it's going to be a fun US Open. And Tom, to that end, being it's a link style golf course, is that going to give an advantage maybe to some of the European players that are more used to not only playing links courses, but playing, you know, in the elements, right? With the wind, whether they might get some rain out there or not. Is that going to give more of an advantage to the European players? You know, I, they thought, they thought that last year at Aaron Hills, they thought that at Chambers Bay, um, and it didn't turn out that way. Um, yeah, I, I, Chris, I'm I'm not a big believer on in, in the European player or the American player. I think it's the player who controls his golf ball that week. The, these players play all over the world. They, you know, they they don't play just in America anymore. It's a world game. They play in the different conditions every week. They travel. They go overseas. They play different venues. They play different conditions. Um, they all know how to hit the hit the ball and fight the ball down. Um, I, no, I don't. I don't think a European player necessarily has more of an advantage than an American player, or vice versa. I just think it's the player who controls his ball that week and does his preparation properly for that kind of style of golf course and is ready to play the game and make some putts. 
Tom, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk some instruction. And for most of us, like I say, you know, at the top with the with the weather and the and the cold temperatures, most of us are just now starting to get to a point where we can go get our golf clubs and start to to swing them again. What, what are some things that we should do to get ourselves ready for a new golf season to get our golf swings sort of back in form? Well, Chris, to be really honest, with you, if, if you're just trying to get ready now um, and you haven't been doing any work indoors all winter long, you're, you're behind. You're behind. You're, you're four, or six, or eight weeks behind. You should have been stretching. You, you should have been swinging a weighted club in your garage. You should have been swinging a swing fan or an orange whip in your garage. Um, you should have been putting indoors, uh, and, and I hope you were. But the people who did those things definitely have an edge on the people who did not. Uh, but that being said, if you haven't done that, you need to start doing those things right away. Um, the, the thing I'm concerned most about is is early season injury. You know, if you've been sitting around all winter and you put a couple of pounds on and and you haven't been doing any stretching or haven't been swinging and making a swing motion at all, and you go out there and you start beating a lot of balls right out of the box, you know, I'm worried about your lower back. I'm I'm worried about you know your upper 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 back and your neck and your and your you know maybe your rotator cuff or things like that. So I, I want you stretching, uh, and I would suggest you start doing those things right away. So there's lots of things you can do to get ready. I, I love the orange whip as a training tool, as, as, a, as a tool to keep your motion live and keep you elongated. Um, but you've got to be doing some early season stretching, and you've got to get out there. And when you do get out and hit golf balls, the first four or five days, folks, don't, be, don't grab the – please don't grab the driver. Just pick out your wedges, hit some, you know, hit some partial shots, just some 30, 40, 50, 60-yard wedge shots. Just make some contact. You know, get your balance in, in check. You know, start to develop some timing and tempo and sequence. Don't don't start ripping drivers right out of the box. And Tom, to that point, right? So, you know, now if we if we go through and do all of those things, and now we're you know we're we're a little more limber, we're a little bit ready now to actually start getting out on the golf so, so, course and actually so Chris, playing so some Chris, golf. It, it, so, so you so you mean it's August now? Now now you're in August. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we're not that far. Oh, I, I hope by by May we're ready to actually get on a golf course and take some meaningful swings, right? So okay. we we've got a we've got an eight o'clock tea time, let's say, right? We want to get to the golf course. So let's say we get there early, seven o'clock. What am I doing? What's what's the pre pre golf routine that that you would say? Hey, look, here's how you should make your progression to get ready for that eight o'clock tea time. So, so Chris, I'll, I'll give you my routine. I, I, I played golf. <laughs> I had a rare occasion to play golf the last two days, uh, and I don't get to do that much anymore, but I did. And I got to the golf course an hour and a half before my tee time, and, and I stretched for about a half an hour, uh, a solid half hour stretched in the locker room. And then I went out and I, uh, I hit a few putts of varying distances, and I chipped a couple golf balls, and I pitched a couple golf balls, um, and then I hit, and I went to the range, I hit some, Hit some partial wedges, hit some, some gap wedges that went about 50 or 60 yards, probably 15 or 20 of those. Uh, and then I worked my way through the set in, in odd numbers. I went, uh, so I went gap wedge, nine iron, seven iron, five iron, hybrid driver, about 10, 10 of each club. So that's, you know, that's over 100 golf swings. Um, and I felt like I was then ready to play. I went back and hit a few putts before I walked through the first tee and I, and I played golf. So that was an hour and a half of really gradually warming my body up. Um, I had no swing thoughts. It wasn't about trying to do something special. It was just simply about getting my body loose and ready to play golf. Uh, the most, the most intense or most focused thought I might have had was staying in balance or swinging at a reasonable tempo. It wasn't about, you know, put the club here or make that kind of move or make that kind of move. It was really just getting my body ready to go to the first team perform. And you say you had no swing thought, right? So first yeah, tee, right? Yeah. A lot of us get the, the first tee jitters, you know, those sorts of things. When when you're on the first tee, what, are, are, you not, are you just picking out a target and pull it back, swing, and go? Or what are you thinking when you're standing up there on, on number one? You know, Chris, I think if you go to the golf course with, with swing thought or swing thought, I think that, that, that as a coach, that tells me that you haven't done your homework, that you're still, you're still trying to grasp for something. You know, the golf course is about target. The golf course is about routine. The golf course is about, you know, getting folks on playing the game and creating a score. 
It's not about, you know, putting the club in, on a plane or checking my club face or making sure I clear my left hip. You know, I basically aim at a target, I make a swing, and then I repeat the process. Um, so on the first tee, basically, I'm picking out something that I want to, you know, be my target down, down target line. I want to go through a routine that orientates my body to that target, and I want to be an athlete and make a golf swing. And you mentioned the word routine. How important is it, Tom, to have, you know, a standard routine that you go through, pre-shot routine, that you go through and it's repeatable no matter what the golf shot you're looking at? Well, I, th I think that's really easy to, to answer, Chris, by example. I think arguably the greatest player to ever play the game was a fellow named Jack Nicholas. You might have heard of him. And if you look back at Jack's routine over the course of his wonderful career, and, it, and, and you look at it in 1963 or 1983, and you put a stopwatch on it, it's probably exactly the same amount of seconds and exactly the same movements he works his body through to get himself into a, um, a launching pad condition to hit the golf shot. It didn't change his entire career. Um, I, I think that Jack had the greatest pre-shot routine of all time. And if you look at Jack and he probably rated his golf swing in the top 100 swings of all time, he probably wouldn't be in the top 50. You probably think of 50 guys that swung the golf club more classically than Jack Nicholas, But guess what? They didn't beat him. There must have been a reason for that. And I think it was the importance of the routine that kept him in his little bubble, isolated from this thing we call pressure, and able to perform his function. Tom, I recently had the privilege of uh, spending some time with Gary Player. And one of the things he said is, if he could do it all over again, start from scratch, he would have an interlocking grip, and he would putt left hand low. Do you subscribe to either, both of those things? What are your thoughts on, on him, uh, on the interlocking grip and the left hand low? Well, I'm certainly, I'm certainly not in the business of contradicting legends, so I'm not going to contradict or say that Gary's wrong. I'm going to tell you that there, I don't think there's any one way to do this, Chris. I think that we've seen guys be successful left hand low, Pencil grip, claw grip, standard grip, long putter, you know, left arm mount by Kucher does. Um, we've seen great players interlock. We've seen great players overlap. We've even seen some great players with a baseball grip. So I, I think it's kind of horses for courses. And if that's what Gary thinks would have made him better, then God bless him. He should go do that. And if he ever gets reincarnated, he knows where he, where he wants to go. Um, but I, I don't think, I don't believe in everything is the same for everybody. Tom, I want to get your get your thoughts on club selection. I think this is an area where we amateurs seem to struggle. Like, you know, I hit my eight iron 150 yards. If my GPS device says the flag is 150 yards away, I'm automatically going over and I'm pulling my eight iron and and uh, and going at it. Now, you know, if you if you take wind direction out of the equation for a second, if the wind is down and I'm 150 out. Is the eight iron the shot, or are there other things that I should be assessing, you know, regarding, you know, slope of the green, pin placement, it's a over across water. What should I be calculating in my mind before I just automatically decide this is an eight iron shot? Well, Chris, first, first of all, let's back up a little bit. I, my, I'm gonna, let's identify scoring irons. I think scoring irons are from seven iron to to. to uh, L wedge or a 60 degree wedge. I think those are scoring clubs. And I never max out a scoring club. For example, I hit, I also hit an 8 iron 150 yards full on a driving range or on a practice ground. I don't ever hit an 8 iron at 150 yards on the golf course. I don't ever max out a scoring iron. So I think if, if you're, if you're watching a golf on TV, and I'm sure you do, Chris, I'm sure your listeners do, you hear things like he hit a knockdown 8 or he gripped down on a 7 or he made a three quarter swing at a a nine iron. You hear those kind of things all the time. I think it's, it's kind of like throwing darts. You wouldn't rear back and throw a dart from over your right shoulder. It's a very precise, very compact motion because you try to be, be precise and hit the bullseye. So I think that if you watch tour players hit scoring irons, you don't ever see them maxing out scoring irons. So that's number one. And then two, as far as evaluation of the shot, the quality of the lie, the, the terrain in front of you, are you uphill or downhill? Is the ball below your feet? Is the ball above your feet? Um, where is the pin located on the green? Is it a green, is it a green, a yellow, or a red flag? I don't ever shoot at red flags. Yellow flags are possibilities depending on how, how confident I am that day. 
and green flags are always a go. So I think there's a lot of things that go into making decisions on the golf course, and that's why you see guys like Joey Lacava working for Tiger Woods, the best in the business in, uh, in, in carrying a golf bag for a living. They help players make those kind of decisions and evaluate all those conditions before they make a club selection. Tom, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the mental side of the game, and and one of the things that you address in your book, and again, it's titled "The Six Spoke Approach to Golf." You talk about how to quiet your mind on the golf course. How can we relax our mind so that we can play more freely? Well, you've got one of the best in the business coming on after me, and and I want to give a shout out to Doc too. He's just a wonderful, wonderful man, and and Chris, you're blessed to have him on your show. He I had the good fortune to be 17 and spending some time, spending some time at, at, at the Masters with him, talking to him, and he's just a, just a saint, just a prince of a man. So that, that question is better suited for him, but I'll give it my best shot. I think your mind is the quietest on the golf course when very simply you're best prepared to play the game. So Bobby Knight is a, an old friend of mine, and, and he used to say, piss poor preparation leads to piss poor performance, which is classic Bobby Knight. So, you know, so many of my club players don't understand why they don't play well. And I ask, ask them, how many times did you go to the practice day this week? How many times did you pitch and putt for an hour this week? How many times did you work in your sand game this week? How many times did you go to the putting ring this week? And how long did you warm up before your round? And you know what kind of answer they generally get from the general public. So you go to the practice tee to do things to allow you to have a quiet mind when you go to the first tee. Proper preparation will lead to a quieter mind, and there's no shortcuts, none at all. Tom, as we circle back to the U.S. Open at Shinnecock, and when people are there, they can come see you for one of your summer golf schools. They can get instruction for you because you're going to be back up in that neck of the woods here real soon. Talk about how they can find you, get in contact with you, and schedule a lesson with you. Yeah, Chris, the best way to always get to me is through my website at www.tompaxley.com. Just to make a correction from earlier, I will not be at Billy Rock this year. I'm going to change venues. I'm, I'm going to have a, an announcement here in the next two weeks at a very special place. I'm going to be in the Saratoga, New York area for some golf schools. And uh, they, can, they can only find out that from my website or through my newsletter, which they just can subscribe to through my website. I will be back on Long Island, uh, you know, which is near and dear to me. It's where I grew up and, 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 and the place I love going back to during the summer. And you can also find out what my location on Long Island through my website at www.tompatry.com. And, uh, it's going to be a wonderful summer. I got a couple of neat things coming up that I, that I can't quite let out of the bag yet, Chris, but I'll be able to announce them very shortly and all that information will be available on that site. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Tom, let our listeners also know how they can follow you on social media as well. Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. I'm, I'm at all those places, Chris. Uh, I love hearing from people. I love having people ask me questions on those on, at those places. The best place to ask me a question is through my Facebook page. Um, but they can also, you know, I, I'm happy to get an email from those people. My email address is on my website at tompatry.com. I'm happy to answer their questions and, and, and steer them in the right direction if they need help with, with equipment, with, you know, golf courses to play, with places to go and visit, you know, and places to vacation. I, I just love, I love the game of golf and I love interacting with those people out there that are as passionate about it as you and I are. Tom, I always like to end our time together by quoting you from an, <clears throat> pardon me, from an article that appeared in the Naples Daily News a few years ago. And in it, you stated, treasure each day to its fullest. Learn and enjoy as best you can from your experience. Let no one event get you down. And finally, thank God for every day your eyes open and you see the sky, which is great advice for all of us to follow each and every day. And one of the things that I treasure most is getting to spend some time with you. Thanks for coming back on the show tonight, Tom. Chris, I, I, I'm, I'm come back on your show anytime you ask me. It's a pleasure being with you. Please make sure you give Doc my best coming up here in just a second. And uh, and God bless our troops, and thank you for supporting our troops. And, and God bless America and all those folks out there listening. Hope I hear from them soon. Fantastic. Tom, take care, my friend. We'll catch up again real soon. Thanks, Chris. Good night now. See you, Tom. That's Tom Patry, and uh, he, the last name is spelled P-A-T-R-I. So Tom Patry 
dot com is uh, is his website. It's fantastic, folks. So I highly recommend go on there, check it out, give him a follow on Twitter. Again, it's at Tom Patry. Um, the amount of instruction, the daily advice, the things that come out in his newsletter. Again, you're talking about uh, one of the top 100. They say top 100 instructors, right? I would tell you he is. If he is not one, he is one A on the planet. So. It, uh, it just really doesn't get any better than Tom Patry. I hope you'll go check it out online. Give him a follow on uh, all the different social media networks, and uh, we look forward to having Tom back as part of the show again real soon. Before I get to my next guest, Dr. Bob Jones, I want to give a shout-out to a few of our sponsors. First, first, folks, you've heard me talking about Club Hub Sensors for the last several months. Well, it's the best portable shot tracking and swing analysis golf device out on the market. Other shot trackers tell you what happened. Club Hub tells you what happened and why. Take the progress that you make over on the practice tee directly to your rounds with the only device of its kind that can go on the course with you. I have Club Hub sensors on all of my clubs. They screw right into the tops of your grips. And I can tell you, since I put the Club Hub sensors on my clubs, I've learned more about my swing and all the data surrounding it than I've learned over the 40 years I've been playing golf. Because not only do you get GPS distances to the hazards into the green, but after the round, you can look back at the images and the layout of every hole in the course that you just played and see exactly where and how far you hit every shot. And no other GPS tool on the market captures that and lets you go back and review your round the way the Club Hub app does. It's available for Androids or iPhones, and the app keeps track of your swing speed of every club in your bag, your tempo, your angle of attack, plus you get a 3D view of your swing as well. And no other rangefinder can do all of that for you. Go over to clubhubgolf.com and order your set of Club Hub sensors today and enter the coupon code NEXT to get 10% off on all products at checkout. Again, go to clubhubgolf.com, enter the coupon code NEXT, and you're going to get the best GPS and swing analysis tool on the market for a great low pricing to see your game in a whole new way. I also want to remind you about our friends over at Par Bar. Energy and focus on the course are essential, whether you're playing you know, on tour in your club championship or just a weekend four ball with your buddies. Par Bar is the golfer's nutritional bar that can help you with both of those things, energy and focus. Eat some before you get to the first tee and the rest every three holes until it's gone, and you're going to play with more energy and focus to win. Par Bar was developed by a lifelong golfer and a food scientist to help all golfers play their best. Go online to parbargolf.com and order yours today. We are also excited to be partnering with the Ben Hogan Golf Equipment Company. They are back with the same great equipment that you know and love without the retail markup that you hate. You can now buy premium Ben Hogan irons, wedges, utility irons, hybrids, bags, and accessories directly from the factory at a, at a price that your wallet's really going to appreciate. Visit them online at BenHoganGolf.com or give them a call at 844-53-HOGAN. That's 844-534-6426 to learn more and order your set today. And this segment of the show, folks, is sponsored by the PGA Tour Superstore. This segment of the show is brought to you by the PGA Tour Superstore. See why golfers everywhere are proud to call PGA Tour Superstore their golf pro shop. Visit them online at PGATourSuperstore.com. Now back to Chris and more of the show. And now back with me on the French Lick Resort guest line is Dr. Bob Jones, the fourth grandson of Bobby Jones. Let me remind you about Doc's background. He was born and raised in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, which is located in the very western part of the state over near the New York state line. Now lives in Johns Creek, Georgia, here just down the road from me in northeast of Atlanta. He studied at St. Minard Seminary and School of Theology, and he graduated from the Georgia School of Professional Psychology. He has a bachelor's degree in English literature, a master's in divinity, and a doctorate in clinical psychology. He's now working as a sports psychologist here in town. It's been such a wonderful experience getting to know Doc over the last year or so, and I am so excited that he is back with me tonight here on Next on the T. Hey, Doc, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Chris, thanks. It's great to be with you again. So, Doc, I wanted to start off our time tonight, first of all, getting your impression of this year's Masters Tournament. What, what are your thoughts about what you saw at the tournament plus uh, Patrick Reed's victory? Well, I got to tell you, well, first of all, before I, I speak to that, uh, I can't, I, 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 can't, I got to tell you, I'm having a hard time finding words. When you're on the same show with somebody as wonderful as Tom Patrick, it's really a hard act to follow, but I'm going to give it a shot. So uh, he's, Tom's one of my favorite guys, and I agree with you. If he's not top 100, he's 1A. He's he's about the best. So, Indeed. at any rate, uh, 
about the Masters, I thought it was uh, I thought it was a wonderful tournament this year, uh, as it is every year. Augusta seems to always have this almost magical ability to uh, create a memorable event, and I think uh, to watch Patrick Reed's uh, control over the event and his focus during the entire tournament was um, really something to watch. Uh, I, I thought I thought that that final round was uh, was just superb, and there was almost no area of the game of golf, be it the uh, physical game or the mental game of golf, where Patrick Reed was not just excellent. So uh, I, I was really glad. Now I will have to confess, though. I did watch it from my the last round from my favorite seat in my living room. I never wait. Uh, I never wait to leave with the crowd. <laughs> I understand. And, and Doc, w- when you're there on the ground at Augusta National, do, do do some of the patrons or the members there do, do they do they come up to you? They talk to you? They share stories with you about you know your grandfather, whether they whether they saw him live or watched the videos or read a book about him. Do do people come up and talk to you and converse about you about the, the great things that your grandfather did for them? Uh, it happens all the time, and uh, I always I'm I always look forward to it. Uh, I try to never, you know, I mean, I can't always honor all the requests I get that people have to see me during the week, but when people do run into me, I always, if I can, try to take uh, as much time as I can to talk with them. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. And, and yes, sometimes it's members and sometimes it's just people attending the tournament. Uh, Mimi and I got there, my wife, Mimi and I got there um, on Thursday and we went to have lunch at one of the tables on the terrace and we sat down with three guys uh, from South Carolina. And as we just started talking, uh, all of a sudden they looked at the, my badge and it says, you know, Bob Jones the fourth. And they said, oh, my gosh, are, are, are you related to Bobby Jones? And I said, well, that's my grandfather. And we spent an hour uh, at lunch just discussing that. I was thinking back uh, as you were asking the question to when I was there about 15 years ago and Mimi and I were walking up the 10th hole and all of a sudden one of these men came up to me. He was a very old man and, and he had one of those hats that had all of his master's badges on them and believe me, he had a lot of badges and he came up to me and he said, excuse me, I see from your badge your name. He said, are you related to Bobby Jones? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, I want you to know I've been coming to the tournament for a long time. And I looked up at his hat and I said, yes, I can see that. He said, I wanted to let you know that when I first started coming here, uh, I remember when your father would put your grandfather in a golf cart and ride him around the golf course. And he said, the thing that always impressed me is he said, Many times your dad and your grandfather would stop and just talk to me and others of us that were just gathered by the ropes. And he said, you know, that made such an impression on me, Mr. Jones, because they didn't have to do that, and yet they did. And he said, so I just I just had to stop you and tell you about that experience. And uh, that, you know, that that's something that has stuck with me uh, for 15, 20 years. And uh, just this year, too, I had a couple of members who said to me how much they really appreciated all that I do uh, for my grandfather's legacy. And, and, and that, too, is um, it's, a very, it's a very meaningful moment. It's very hard for me to go to Augusta National and not be flooded by memories, not just of my father, and my grandfather, but also of my great-grandfather, Robert Permetus Jones, the colonel, who actually held membership certificate number one when the club opened in 1933. Um, He was was one of, I guess, many legendary men in my background, and even more proof in my case that the gene pool does dilute over time. So... (laughs) (laughs) And, And, Doc... When you've got a name badge on, like in an event like that, or just in, in, in you know, your everyday walk of life, is is it is it a heavy weight on the, on the shoulders? Because you've got to, you know, live up to 
the Bobby Jones, you know, legacy. And you've got the weight of not only the, the name and the heritage, but you've got a brand, right? There's the Bobby Jones brand, which we're partnering with and honored to do so. But is it a weight on your shoulder? Do you have to be very careful about all of that? You have to be careful. I mean, but, you, don't, you know, I have to be careful. I mean, not because – I mean, there's nothing I can really do that's going to affect – uh, my grandfather's legacy, but I do try to be careful because I do carry the name, and I wouldn't want anybody to really think badly of my family because of me. And I'm not saying I'm always perfect at it any more than any of us are perfect in the daily course of our lives, but uh, but it, it's something that's always there. It probably used to be more of a weight than it is now. Now it's a responsibility. But it's I've I've come to realize as I'm getting older, I'll be 61 in June, as I've gotten older, I've come to realize that what it really is is a great privilege, and it offers me an opportunity to connect with people that I might not otherwise ever, uh, ever encounter. And uh, that's what's really, really important and really exciting, I think, about carrying the Jones name. And I always try to remember that. Doc, uh, one of our mutual friends, Peter Kessler, might know yes. more about your grandfather than your grandfather knew about himself. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's amazing to me to sit back and listen to Peter share stories about the things that, that your grandfather did. Have you ever sat down with Peter and just sort of swap Bobby Jones stories? We have on a number of occasions, we've, but we've also even done that uh, when he was with uh, Golf Channel. Uh, my favorite Peter Kessler story, though, is um, what Peter, and Peter loves to tell this, and it's a funny story. When Peter was playing uh, at the old course one time, he tried to figure out as best he could where my grandfather hit his last full shot on the old course. And he kind of got it narrowed down, and so what he did was he went out and he hit a shot from that same spot and made sure to take a divot. He then went back and got out a, a plastic baggie and put the divot into the baggie and put it back in his golf bag. When he was on his way back into the Atlanta airport, of course, he gets stopped because, you know, he's coming back into the United States. And the customs, and, the customs enforcement people say to him, do you have any agricultural items that are in your possession? And Peter said no. And the guy's going through his golf bag, and he pulls out this baggie filled with grass. And he looks at Peter, and he says, well, well, what is this? And Peter, at this point, is worried that he's going to lose his Bobby Jones divot. And so P Peter tells the guy at the customs desk, he says, well, you know, he said, I'm a big Bobby Jones golf fan, and this is a divot that I took from the spot where Jones hit his last shot at the old course. And I guess he figured that the customs agent was going to look at him like he was just out of his mind. And instead, it turns out the guy was an avid golfer and let him go. So Peter was able to get agricultural <laughs> contraband into the United States. <laughs> still one of the best stories, and I hope I've done it justice. It is still one of the funniest stories I have ever heard in my life. But again, what, is that, what that tells you is now here is a man in Peter Kessler who is a sharp guy and uh, who has been around the block in the world of sports for a long time, who never, ever knew my grandfather, at least not in the sense of ever talking with him, looking him square in the eye or any of that sort of thing. And yet my grandfather has moved him uh, and moved his life uh, dramatically. Another example is Sid Matthew, who's the golf uh, lawyer and a golf historian in Tallahassee, who was doing a deposition at my grandfather's old law firm, and he started. He was doing it in the Bob Jones room, and as he looked around the room when they were on break, he became fascinated with Bobby Jones. And the next thing you know, here we are, uh, 20 years, 25 years later, and Sid has produced a movie on Bob, has written uh, seven books on my grandfather, and is generally regarded as one of the leading Bobby Jones historians. Uh, in the world. In fact, my friend, my friend, the late John Imlay, used to always say that Sid Matthew has a distinction of being the only man he knows that's written more books than he's read. 
But again, <laughs> you know, he, he, here is a had no real connection to my grandfather, and yet this intersection between his life and who my grandfather was uh, has indelibly changed Sydney's life. And, you know, I, I just find it, as I get older, I get more and more amazed at the number of people uh, whose life has been so impacted by Robert Tyre Jones, Jr. And, and you mentioned our business. Is, uh, that's one of the things that we always try to remember is this is the legacy of anything that we do. And we, we try to always keep that in mind. Doc, one of the things that people have been talking about over the last couple of months, you know, with Tiger's latest comeback, it sort of rekindled the talk of, you know, who's the greatest player of all time. But, you know, I think I think your grandfather and players of his era, plus, you know, maybe the guys right after him, the Ben Hogan's and the Sam Sneeds, they get left out of that conversation because – there aren't many people left who saw them play or, or, or who read anything more than what they can find on Twitter nowadays. You know, so few people know the magnitude of what your grandfather accomplished. Are, are you disappointed your grandfather doesn't get mentioned, you know, right up there with Nicholas and, and, and Woods about who, you know, who the greatest player of all time is? No, not really. I, I think that's just the way of the world. Uh, I think what often happens is that as people come to know Bobby Jones, uh, they start to realize just what an incredible thing it was that he did, not just in the world of golf, but in how he lived his life. Um, I also think there's a tendency that we have now to think that the world began with the advent of color television. And it's hard to believe that anybody who's filmed in black and white could actually have been such a great athlete. But when you look in the history of the game of golf, uh, yeah, you have a number of great golfers, but there have only been three people in the history of the, at least the modern game in the 20th century, uh, and now the 21st. There have only been three people that have moved the needle in terms of massive popularity shifts. One of them was Bobby Jones, the other was Arnold Palmer, and the third was Tiger Woods. They brought huge numbers of players into the game of golf uh, and were incredibly pivotal for their time. Uh, Arnie basically resurrected the British Open. Arnie basically put the United States, uh, our, our Masters tournament, on the map. Um, Tiger uh, brought people to the game that we've, uh, he brought minorities in, into at least the interest of the game like we had never seen before, just as Palmer brought the working guy into the game, which he did in the 1960s and uh, early part of the 70s. So I guess my point to that would be, no, I'm not necessarily surprised, but I think as people become involved in the game and learn more about it, um, Bobby Jones's place in the history of the game, I think, is going to be a fairly safe one. And my family is going to take, I think, some steps, especially over the next few years, to make sure that uh, that he's not totally forgotten by time. Sorry, Doc, I'm not doing much we... on sound bites, am I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not looking for sound bites. I'm looking for your stories and your thoughts. Oh, well, there you Doc, go. I... I can do that. Then we're good. Yes. Doc, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk sure. about the work you're doing now as a as a sports psychologist. And and when sure. people are coming to you the most, you know, to get get your help and your assistance, is it is it with needing to you know confidence as a problem? Is it dealing with anxieties? What what are most of the people that you're talking with struggling with? I think the biggest thing that most people struggle with is. Um, uh, there are two areas I would say that I've noticed particularly recently. Uh, one of them, surprisingly, is goal setting. Uh, people have a tendency to set a goal with a hard stop limit. For example, uh, I had a client a few years back whose goal was to play, uh, and I'm going to hide identities when I talk about this because I just don't, um, I just don't, reveal my client my client list but I had someone to come to me and uh, she was a pretty good player uh, 
And she said to me, she said, I said, well, what is it you want to accomplish? And she said, well, my goal is I want to qualify for the women's amateur, the U.S. women's amateur. And I said, okay, and then what? Well, you know, I, I, I hadn't really given that much thought. Now, she is coming to see me about three or four weeks before the tournament. And so I wasn't able to really may help her make a shift into a more open-ended goal. But, uh, but I will say that, you know, she qualified for the tournament very, very comfortably, and she achieved that goal of getting in the tournament. So one of the things that we're working now on for this year is a slightly different goal, and that goal is win it. Because if you set a goal that is absolutely fixed like a stone wall, your mind is going to accept that. And so when you hit that, if you don't have a goal to get beyond that, then you're going to have a problem. I'll give you an example. Uh, you see a lot of guys who will tell you their goal is to play the PGA Tour. Well, that's really nice, but what happens once you get there? Then if you don't have another goal beyond that set up, then you really run into an issue. So that would be one area in terms of proper goal setting and also I would say realistic goal setting. For example, if a businessman is coming to me who has a handicap index of 13.1 and he tells me that he wants to play in the U.S. mid-amateur by this August, that might not be the most realistic goal in the world. Right? You see what I mean? Yeah. So, okay. So what end. do we do? We help him adjust. We help him adjust to what is an achievable goal for him, and he can set. Then he can set a strategy on how he's going to achieve it. So that's that's the one area. I'll get to the other, but it sounds like you have a question. Well, no. I mean, I'm just sort of curious, right? So, should when we think about goals, should we have a list of goals five, ten, whatever the number should be? that will take us, you know, as we sort of look into the future, a year, five years, 10 years, whatever it might be, or should we have a goal and then a contingent goal for, okay, my first goal is this, and then when I achieve that, then I want to do this, and then when I achieve that, then I want to do this other thing? Uh, I think both are actually okay, but I would never make it a, a goal list of five to 10. That is just a huge number, too huge a number. And also, the more you, the, the more numbers you get on your goal list, the more your goals are going to become more subjective and less measurable. Okay, and when a goal becomes less measurable, it's hard to really figure out how to achieve that. Um, I'll give you an example on a personal goal that I had last year. Uh, last year, I started the season with a handicap index of 11.6. And I sat down and I said to myself, now, Bob, look, you're always talking to people about making goals. Maybe it's time you start practicing the stuff you teach. And I sat down and I made a goal list and I said, I want to drop my handicap by my index by one shot. I wanted to be able to get to the end of the season with it at 10.6. And then I sat down and thought, well, how do I do that? And I realized that here I am, I'm 59, 60 years old. The idea of me going out and banging 200 full shots out is just not going to happen. I'm a very accurate driver of the ball, but I'm not hugely long. I mean, for my age, I can pop it out there 235, 240. But, um, but I'm very straight. But then what I realized was I needed to work on my short game. So in order to do it, I went to CR Pro, uh, Jimmy Harris at the Atlanta Athletic Club. And I said, Jimmy, give me a short shot. Just a go-to wedge shot that I can use whenever, I've, whenever I miss a green. And so I spent the entire year last year working on you know, short wedge shots, bunker shots, and putting like there was no tomorrow. And then occasionally I'd hit maybe five or ten drivers a day. By the end of the year, my index was at 9.1. So there is a measurable goal that I set, and then I created the methodology that I needed to do just in terms of my technique to achieve that. Now, sometimes the methodology requires that you use uh, some more psychological stuff, but as your previous guest, as Tom just said, 
if you're not to sing the physical stuff that you need to do to achieve the goal, uh, there, there's just not, you're, you're just painting lipstick on the pig. Well, I don't think Tom said it that way. He's much more eloquent, but you get the point. So I think that's the biggest thing about goal setting. It has to be, they have to be a fairly short number, and they have to be very measurable. And All then right. You so, so you said there were two things. Goal setting is one. What's two? Uh -huh. Two, I think, and this is something that applies to every single golfer, whether it is uh, whether he is a 20 handicapper or a tour player, and that is managing your emotional range. Um, we spend a lot of time worrying about what do you do when a person's anxiety level really, really gets high. How do you get them back into an optimal range of functioning? And that's an important thing to know how to do. But it is equally important to know what do you do when you get underneath your optimal range of functioning. And I'm going to give you an example of what I mean by that. A uh, business executive came to see me, a very, very fine player, uh, carried at the time he came to see me a uh, plus one handicap. Uh, his biggest problem was he would always start out like – two or three over par after five holes, and then he would then finish strong. When I, when I, remember, he finished strong enough to have a plus one, so this was not shabby play. I went through what his warm-up routine was, and I realized that it was, there was nothing wrong with his warm-up. It wasn't like he was going to the course still cold, but what it was was that he is one of these guys that tends to be, uh, the technical term would be understimulated. A better word would probably be very low-key. And so what we had to work on, and I had to use a hypnotic technique to help him with it, was I had to use a hypnotic induction that he could use to bring him up to that, that proper level where he needed to be. And uh, he went out, uh, the, the very next time he went out, this was a little dramatic, it doesn't always work this way, but the next time he went out after that, in his very first round, his opening nine was uh, 31 from the tips of an extremely difficult golf course, and uh, he followed it up with a 34 on the back nine and just a blistering 65. And because he was able to get into that optimal range and stay there. So that, I think, is the second area, I think, that, uh, that, that we really have to deal with a lot in terms of sports psychology. So that begs the question for, and you know, obviously you can't give everybody a, a hypnotic, you know, sort of uh, a suggestion or that sort of thing. But how, how can we, right, how can the rest of us sort of get into the, the range where we need to be? Is there something that we can do? Is there a, a thought we can have? Is there a way that we can try to get ourselves, you know, at least, you know, into a, in, into a better state, whether we're coming into it too high or too low? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, uh, the, the little warning that I would put on top of that, uh, Chris, is that, you know, it, it's a little different for every person. But every golfer, no matter what the handicap level, has in their memory banks, uh, has in their memory banks both the cognitive and emotional memories of shots that they have hit very well. They have the entire experience of every time they have been in the zone. And sometimes it really helps just to take some time when you're at home and just sit down and uh, just and just let yourself relive those shots as much as you possibly can and to do it as vividly as you can, to uh, see what the grass looked like uh, around the ball as you stood over it, to actually picture the ball and the club, to actually do as much as you can to visualize and feel what that swing felt like and to see the ball in the air or to see that putt drop. The more you can get those kinds of experiences in your brain, then that becomes something that you can draw on when you're on the course. Now, uh, so basically your own memory banks will carry, uh, will carry you through with that. Another thing that's helpful that it's very funny. I used to do this when I was a kid. 
when I was growing up, we I played at a club in Nashville, Bellmead Country Club. And we weren't allowed to play until 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Saturday and Sunday because that's when the everybody could the members could play and us juniors couldn't. So a lot of times we would watch the PGA Tour telecasts before we went on to the golf course. And invariably, I always found when I had spent a couple of hours watching tour players hit the golf ball, uh, I often found that my rhythm and my swing was much, much better when I actually went to the golf course, and I thought my way around the course better. And now I know that what that was is that experience had placed me in a more optimal level of functioning. So I think that's another thing that the average player can do, because uh, never underestimate the power of imitation. Doc, just a couple more before we let you go. And I, I know you have a very sure. strong faith and a religious conviction. Talk about the role that uh, faith plays in your life. Well, uh, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior when I was uh, 15 years old. And um, to me, it is the most important thing. Um, it is more important than my practice. It's more important than uh, even my family, because if my faith falters, the rest of it goes, period. Um, I have been very blessed in my life to meet some really, really wonderful people and to be able uh, to, be able to share faith with them. Um, I think that, um, I forget the gentleman's name, but whoever it was that wrote that, uh, what was it, Seven Days in Utopia, I think he had it right. And that is that, uh, and of course, I, I don't always deal with this with clients that I'm dealing with, but it is a true thing. And that is that ultimately, everything that we try to do, whether it's on the golf course or not, there has to be a higher purpose to it. There has to be a greater reason why we're doing something than simply just moving a golf ball around, uh, you know, 7,000 yards of, of turf. Um, and so to me, I find that grounding in, in my faith, and I'm very, very um, – I'm actually very very interested to answer the question uh, as to whether there's golf in heaven. I'm just not really interested in answering it tomorrow. So, um, <laughs> yeah, but it is very important to it, me. You know, it's funny. I'm working with a 13-year-old young man right now who's a really, really outstanding player. Uh, he probably already plays better golf than I ever have or will. Um, but, you know, I like to think that, you know, if I were to play him, that uh, youth and youth and skill are no match for age and deceit. So we, we will see. <laughs> but, you know, this kid, this kid is so strong. And when you sit there, every time when I talk to him, I'll, I'll tell him, I say, so what are your goals? And he'll tell me what his two or three goals are at the time. And every time I'll ask him, what's the most important thing? And this 13-year-old will look me dead square in the eye and say, my faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. And I'll tell him, I think you're going to be fine. <laughs> I think you're going to be exactly. fine. Exactly. So, Doc, let our listeners know. How can they find you, stay up to date with the things you're doing, follow you, whether it's online or it's on social media? Best way to get a hold of me, uh, you can visit me on my website, which is at the Behavioral Institute of Atlanta. It's uh, BIA, Bravo India Alpha, Georgia. Bravo India Alpha, Georgia dot com. BIA Georgia dot com. You'll find my, I have a web page on there. It'll also link you to my private page. Uh, the best way to get me in terms of professionally is uh, go to LinkedIn and type in Dr. Dr. Bob Jones the uh, Fourth, and that'll that'll get you to me. Um, I uh, if you want to send me an email, I try to respond to emails pretty quickly, and I can be reached at B Jones at B I A and then the number one dot com. B Jones at B I A one. Dot com. Well, Doc, thank you so much for taking time out of your night to come back and be a part of the show. I always really enjoy sort of being in your presence, if it's even if it's just over the phone. I, I think you're fascinating. You you bring a sense of calm and peace. You know, for me, when when we chat with one another, and it's easy to see why you're such a successful sports psychologist. I can't thank you enough for your time tonight. 
Hey, Chris, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. As I said, it's an honor to be on the same show with Tom Patry. That, that's always can't be beat. So, and you too. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it, Doc. I hope you'll come back real soon. In between now and then, all the best to you and your family, Doc. Thanks, Chris. Take care. You too. That is Dr. Bob Jones the fourth, and uh, I, I just uh, and I mean it sincerely. When when I, when I'm talking with him or I'm listening to him share his stories and his insights, uh, it always means a great deal to me. And and I do. I feel there, there's a presence that Doc has that's um, calming and reassuring, and he's he's just you know he's so smart, and the things that he talks about make such sense. And you know a lot of the things that he, as he was talking through a lot of that stuff, I could think into my mind just like that last part about going back to it and remembering the shots that you've hit well, and and immediately you know, come in my, in my mind I could think about four or five shots that I've hit over the course of, you know, like I say, the 40 years I've been playing golf, and, and most of them have, you know, happened more recently, that, you know, I could I could remember in my mind, I could smile, a smile comes to my face, and all of a sudden, you know, the tension and everything else sort of, you know, goes away, and that's something that I'll absolutely take on the golf course with me every time I play, because that's such solid advice, and it makes such, you know, such sense that, it, you know, you can re- redo those shots, you can be in a better frame of mind, and then you can pull the club back and execute what you want to do. I mean, that's such fantastic stuff. And, and I can't thank Doc enough for, uh, for coming back on the show. This, has been, this is the third time he's been here, and uh, hopefully I'm blessed enough to have him many, many more times. All right, folks, it is time for us to close up this episode of Next on the T. but you know how we like to end every show by getting the words of uh, Jim Estes about the great things that, that he and his team are doing over at the Salute Military Golf Association. The Salute Military Golf Association was created to provide rehabilitative golf experiences to the brave men and women who have been wounded while serving our country. Hi, I'm Jim Estes, PGA Golf Pro and co-founder of the Salute Military Golf Association. With my adaptive golf program, we've successfully helped thousands of soldiers in their recovery, both mentally and physically. The SMGA has been providing family-inclusive golf experiences across the country since 2007. To date, the SMGA has equipped more than 1,000 warriors with properly fitted golf clubs and has extended its clinic series to more than eight chapter and affiliate locations across the U.S. If you are a wounded veteran interested in participating or if you'd like to learn more about the Salute Military Golf Association and find a chapter closest to you, visit our website at smga.org. We've seen firsthand how impactful golf can be in aiding one's recovery. The Salute Military Golf Association, empowering wounded veterans one fairway at a time. Visit smga.org. That's smga.org. Yeah, folks, Jim and his team continue to do such wonderful things at the Salute Military Golf Association. To find out more information and how you can get involved, go online to smga.org. All right, folks, time for me to put a bow on this episode of Next on the Team. My sincere thanks again go out to Tom Patry and Dr. Bob Jones, of course, for joining me this week. I hope you enjoyed the show as well. Please give me your thoughts. Go online on our Facebook page, Next on the Team with Chris Mascaro, and share your feedback. Plus, if you've got a question, for one of our future guests, let me know. I can get that question on the air for you or something that maybe you wanted to ask somebody that you heard on uh, on the show as a podcast or one of our previous guests. Please let me know. Be glad to you know get that question over uh, to that person and, and get an answer back to you. Please also check out our show on the uh, football side, Thursday Night Tailgate, with me and my co-host Bob Lazari and our announcer Joe Lajanusa. That show airs live every Thursday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. You can stream it live by going on Blog Talk Radio and that show like this one. Also available as a free podcast over on iHeartRadio and on Podbean. Can't thank our good friends on Podbean enough. They've been featuring this show next on the T right there on the on the Podbean app, right on the homepage. So if you download the Podbean app, boom, you're going to see next on the T right there. Can't thank them enough for that. Plus, if you just love podcasts, folks, across all genres, not, not just golf or not just sports, across every genre, Podbean's the place for you to go check those out. You can go online to podbean.com or, like I say, download that Podbean app. Getting back to Thursday Night Tailgate, we are joined every week by five NFL legends sharing their stories from their playing days and their insights into what's going on around the NFL now. Plus, we also highlight two players doing great things in their communities in our Spotlight on the Positive segment. You can find that show online at ThursdayNightTailgate.com. And this show, our website is nextonthetea.net. 
Folks, thanks again for choosing to listen to the show tonight. We know you've got hundreds of shows and podcasts to listen to. We really appreciate the fact that you are making Next on the T one of them. Until next week, hit them straight, my friends. You've been listening to Next on the T with Chris Mascaro, where PGA and LPGA pros and top instructors and media members go to tell their stories. Join us the same time every Tuesday to hear more stories about the game we love from people who love sharing those stories with you. It's all about the great game of golf. It's all about the great game.